late 1950s, the USA needed to replace its B-52 bombers with faster aircraft to counter the ever-improving Russian anti-aircraft technology. In 1957, North American Aviation came up with the ingenious concept of the XB-70 Valkyrie. This design for an enormous bomber which could fly at supersonic speeds, three times the speed of sound, was innovative in many ways. Even though the model kit was relatively inexpensive, by weight it consisted of a surprising amount of plastic, which made it somewhat cumbersome and heavy, and everything was housed in an impressively large box. The various parts were rather loosely packed inside, but were well molded and with very little flash. The air inlet compression afterbody was packed separately and had some nice details to it. Unfortunately, the majority of the aircraft surface featured raised panel lines, which would need to be rescribed later. This was quite a daunting thought given the size of the aircraft. Luckily, some of the larger areas had recessed panel lines which didn't need any scribing. By placing the foremost part of the aircraft next to the compression afterbody, one starts to get a vague idea of the true size of the model. The wingtips each had their own sprue trees, also expertly molded, and included halves of the wheels and their landing gear, and an air inlet wall. The second wingtip sprue tree had all the mirror image parts of the first one. A third sprue tree contained the jet engines which became known as the six-pack by the Valkyrie's pilots and engineers. It also contained the cockpit and the pilot seats. Packed separately were the upper and lower wings of the Valkyrie. They were enormous and slightly warped with age. Getting them to fit together properly proved to be one of the biggest challenges of the build. The wings had some large sprue attachments which looked like they were going to be tricky to get rid of without damaging the parts they were attached to. There was some nice detail at the rear of the wings where the jet engines would be positioned. Also, the elevons on either side were nicely detailed. Sadly, the opposite side of the wings was also covered with the all-pervasive raised panel lines. The wing also had a few injector pin marks, mostly on the inner side of the wing, and these did not look like they were going to cause any major problems. The rest of the fuselage was in two parts, packed separately from the rest of the kit. The next sprue contained the verticals, which were the tail fins which helped to steer the aircraft. It also contained connector segments for building the Valkyrie's wingtips in a straight configuration, which is how they were positioned for subsonic flight. The final sprue contained the canards, which would be placed towards the front of the aircraft, and an alternative set of connector segments for building the wingtips in a downward configuration which was their position during supersonic flight. There were two versions of the canopy, depending on whether one wished to build air vehicle number one or air vehicle number two. The instructions were neatly printed and very easy to follow. There weren't very many steps, as the kit mostly consisted of a few large parts. The painting guide was also very concise and well annotated. The decals were crisp and bright, and I thought they were going to look awesome on the final model. The raised panel lines were quite a bone of contention for me. 
My solution to the problem was to give the grey plastic parts a good base coat of white before assembly and then sand them down so that the base coat layer was as thin as possible. By this method the panel lines would show up clearly and flush with the surface, ready for rescribing. Unfortunately this idea did not work as well as I'd hoped. While it did indeed make easy work of rescribing the panel lines, it was an absolute disaster when it came to applying glue to the base coated parts. The wings and fuselage had large surfaces which needed to be bonded together and had enormous seam lines which needed to be smoothed down as much as possible. Once the primer coat was applied, however, it was nearly impossible to get the parts to stick together even after sanding the paint away from these areas. Suffice it to say, this kit became a self-made nightmare. In retrospect, I should have built the aircraft first and primed it afterwards. Oh well, I chalked it up to a hard lesson well learned. Once the primer had dried, it was time to tackle the cockpit sub-assembly. I removed all the relevant parts from their sprues and clean them of any flash and excess plastic. They didn't fit together very well and required quite a bit of manipulation once the glue was applied. Even so, they were nicely detailed. The real pilot seats were cleverly designed. In an emergency, they folded over in a clam-like fashion and encapsulated the pilots in an airtight module. From here, the pilots could still have limited control of the aircraft and could be safely jettisoned from the aircraft at high speeds if necessary. On the fateful day when Air Vehicle No. 2 crashed, Al White, an experienced Valkyrie pilot, ejected moments before the aircraft hit the ground and, although badly injured, he managed to survive. Unfortunately, because of the G-forces of the descent, his inexperienced co-pilot could not eject in time and died on impact. After the glue had cured, I filled in the small gaps with Mr. Surfacer and smoothed down the excess once it dried, first with a mini file and then with sandpaper. I managed to find a few good reference pictures for the pilot seats which simplified the painting process quite a bit. After painting the seats, I gave them a gloss coat to prepare them for their oil wash later. I applied the decals to the instrument panels. I positioned them carefully and made sure to dab up the excess water with a cotton bud. I did the same for the side instrument panels and allowed them to dry. In one of the reference pictures, I noticed that the seats had harnesses made from a pink fabric. I decided to make some harnesses too, using masking tape and thin soldering wire for the buckles. These were by no means perfect, but I thought they would add a bit of detail for someone to see when they peered into the cockpit. I decided to use true metal dark aluminium to paint the landing gear and Panzer Aces dark rubber for the wheels. I squeezed out a little of the dark aluminium from the tube and thinned it with some odorless solvent. The true metal range is very versatile. Besides thinning it down and applying it by brush, it can be thinned even further and used in an airbrush or used straight out of the tube as a metal polish. Once dry, it has a beautiful metallic sheen.
Panzer Aces Dark Rubber is my favorite color for tires. I thinned it down with a few drops of thinning medium and painted the tires while they were still on their sprues. I found it was easier to manipulate them and do a neater job while they were held in a steady position. It would however mean a bit of extra painting once the two halves were cut from the sprues and assembled. But I figured there would probably be seam lines to take care of and these would require a bit of touching up anyway. Once assembled, I would dry brush the tires with some light rubber for added texture. In order to obtain those supersonic speeds, almost the whole fuselage and wings of the Valkyrie was filled with fuel, which meant that space was limited. For this reason, the designers added another unique and innovative feature to the aircraft. When the landing gear extended or retracted, it rotated and folded in a complex fashion in order to fit inside the small storage bays. The next part of the build consisted of mounting the cockpit in the forward part of the fuselage. I was a little concerned because the edges of the parts were joined to the sprues with large thick connector points. Luckily they were fairly easy to trim and were more or less smooth after filing. One of the parts would require some filling with putty at a later stage. I test fitted the cockpit and everything came together quite neatly. I finally applied some glue, but getting the cockpit to stay put proved to be quite a challenge. Finally, after a few grueling minutes, I won the fight and the two halves of the fuselage were glued together with the cockpit firmly in place. There were some seam lines to take care of, which would be tricky because of the surrounding raised panel lines and the two antenna on the bottom. The parts which made up the rear section of the fuselage were also bound to their sprues with those large connector points. Once again, I removed the excess as carefully as possible and neatened things up with a mini file. I glued the one half of the rear section to the front section of the fuselage. When I glued the second half, I applied copious amounts of glue to the seam lines, hoping to get a neat rigid seam. This was only partially successful, as the seam required a lot of filling and sanding later to make it completely invisible. By the time I got to gluing the lower wings together, I was fairly well practiced at removing those bulky sprue connectors. A little more filing and I was ready to join the two wing halves at their center line. As I spread on the glue and joined the wings in sections, it quickly became apparent that these two large sheets of styrene were a little warped 
and were going to need to be forced together for a decent fit. Along both halves of the wing assembly were small tabs which were supposed to guide the two parts to fit together neatly, but they failed dismally in this regard. As a start, I removed parts of these tabs so that the two halves fitted together more readily. I applied glue and tried to hold everything in place until dry, but this was not successful either. The area onto which the glue was applied looked horrible. Luckily, it was going to be hidden from view once the model was completed. The only way to get the two halves to join up was to glue each section separately and apply a heavy weight to allow the section to cure overnight. In the meantime, I masked off the two air intakes and gave them a gloss black undercoat. Once this had dried, I applied a coat of gunmetal to the walls of the air intakes. I applied a coat of gunmetal to the rear of the aircraft too, which was part of the housing for the six-pack. I did not mask off the area, as the six-pack would hide all of the overspray once installed. Using MIG Starship Filth oil color and some thinners, I mixed up an oil wash, which I applied to the storage bays of the landing gear, to dirty them up a bit. The six-pack was also primed in gloss black after which I airbrushed it with Tamiya gunmetal to give it a shiny finish. I needed to paint gunmetal to the upper part of the air intake, which was part of the wing. Notice those large cracks in the seam lines. They appeared time and again during the build and needed to be filled, which was quite frustrating. I masked off the rest of the wing and then I painted the portion which would become the upper intake area, using a brush to give it some texture. The fuselage was glued to the upper wing without much difficulty. After this, I applied a lot of glue to the lower wing, joined the two together, and using several strong clamps, allowed the glue to cure overnight. Sadly, due to the frustration with all the seam lines, I retired the Valkyrie to the top of my cupboard, and there she lay, half-built and unpainted. But I really love the shape and curves of the Valkyrie. She is truly a majestic aircraft. So, after three months, I mustered up the courage to finally get her finished. But that's another story for another video. So long, and thanks for watching.